Welcome back to my mom's basement, ladies and gentlemen. It is Robbie Fox, and I am here with Gavin Rossdale, lead singer of Bush. We're here to talk about the new album, The Art of Survival. It's not the newest. It's the latest album from Bush, but it came out in October. So you've gotten some time to actually play these songs on tour and everything. How has that been? Uh, phenomenal. I don't know what's happening. And it's like, in my true traditional sense of doing everything the wrong way around, we're better than ever and having a great time and people that want to see us want new songs as much as the old songs. There's a really great kind of tension in the set between the older songs and new things and just trying to like, just be great at every point. What's the timeline for this album like from the beginning of writing to the release? Eight months, nine, 10 months, something like that, you know, the beginning of the year. And then they came out pretty fast. And then we've done some, another song that's coming out on the 20, something of April, I think another song, they're going to, to re-release the record like make it deluxe um we've got a we did a recording with amy from evanescence of a song called a thousand years which we have she came and sang with me at the ryman and so i think we're going to release that it was too damn good she's so great yeah she is she's an amazing she really, vocalist like, she um basically took the band uptown you know what i mean like we were like a low rent band and she sings on it we've i've feel like we're like right on the neck and neck like right there with Celine Dion who's an amazing vocalist as good as Celine Dion well I can't wait to hear that that sounds amazing and I think this new album is so cool sonically like it, it just sounds great what were the sonic influences for it whether it comes to guitar bass drums like the sound you were trying to emulate I just I sat in my studio just trying to do really syrupy wide um oceanic kind of music so sort of detuned and then you know all those kind of trippy keyboards and atmospheres and sort of wannabe brian eno plugins that i have <laughs> and then and just sort of create atmosphere and I, I i like i like the music when it's really cinematic you know and really suggestive and wide and, and it's so heavy but yeah i don't sing in a traditional heavy screamo kind of way. So I think that's already a, 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 our own juxtaposition, I think was was cool. Me trying to desperately find melodies on these massive riffs, you know, I'm gonna find that melody. And then when you do, it's like, you just, it's like, it's very, um, they're evasive, those melodies, you know, the magic melodies are sort of in there, in your DNA, but you gotta like, you gotta charm them out. So it's fun. Heavy as the Ocean, the first track on the album. Was that written to be the first track? Because it has that cinematic, almost intro sound. I'm a bass player myself, so I Good. love that bass intro and the way the album kicks off and everything. Did you have that written with it being the opener in mind? It's so weird because generally things happen by chance. and You end up, if you get it right, you look smart retrospectively. Um, and things aren't normally like that. But in this instance... As soon as that, when I was writing, it was weird because I'd been writing and working on music and I hadn't really begun to dive into the record, you know? And when I found that song, found that riff, I was like, I'd never had it before and probably wouldn't have it since, is I was like, this has to dictate the aesthetic of the record. This is what shows me, it's my own weather thing. I, gotta, I can't stray from that track. Because that track is really good. I didn't, you know, I figured out apparently it's like harmonic minor. So suddenly I got really obsessed about the harmonic minor scale. It's like I can't do anything else like harmonic minor because that's really quite that. And uh, so, and then, you know, then after that I had like um, May Your Love Be Pure. And those tracks kind of went together and it just, yeah, it formed the record. And it's weird because I, you make all these plans that inevitably as you get through the process, it, it would change, you know what I mean? The plans are just like placeholders, the words that don't mean anything anymore. Um, but I stuck to it and it, it does, it opens the record and uh, really sets people on their way. And I never, for instance, I called the record The Art of Survival because I figured that everyone had been through so much shit um, and everyone had their story and it wasn't like, oh, this is all about me and my trials and tribulations. It's just like, man, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we went through it, did we not? You know what I mean? It was really like this sort of open, open question suggested, you know? And then, like you're saying, when I figured out to put um, the um, Heavy as the Ocean as the opening track, 
that's where I look smart, where I'm not that smart. It just looked smart because it was like the other survival. Here's the first song. That, uh, so that was a happenstance, but because I didn't know what the album title would be. So, uh, but that, so yeah, it just worked out like that. When it comes to your songwriting process at this point, has it changed a lot in your writing career? Like, do you write songs differently than you wrote them on the first album or is it the well, same kind of stuff? Way hella different. Like, because now we're all, we're all want to be producers, right? So we all got like little rigs, little setups. We'll be like, hey, I had this idea. And then like, out comes this like crazy uh, band of Gavins, you know? And, um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I just, I get blown away with, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of really a basic person. So I find it staggering when I sit there and uh, get the sounds up. I'm a very basic engineer. I can work Pro Tools. I do everything but record my voice. I don't record my voice. I record my voice into the, um, you know, voice recorder when I've got a riff going on. You know? Because I don't want to be that guy in the studio just doing that. I just, oh, there's just something about it. I don't. So I like, I have, I basically get some tracks together. But when I turn on, you know, I've got a beautiful, uh, you know, P bass, beautiful ESP bass, uh, jazz bass. And I, I use my Parallax plugin. I don't know if you've used that Neural. Have you used that? No. You've you got to try it out if you're a bass player. Yeah. Neural. Yeah. The Parallax is fucking, it's like, oh my god so you're just like a king just when you play a note you're like fuck and then if you've got detuned and the riff is working you put that bass with it or you just have a drum beat up i i like to find drum beats and then mess with them a bit you know change them around and just make them my own but i like those ones where you get the feel of a real drummer when i program on start on my own i'm always like somehow chasing my tail when I start with a drummer from program and then I just, you know, move his bass drum around a bit here and there. It feels somehow they get that whole energy, they get that, you know, they feel right. So I just, so the way that I write tracks is um, get drums first. And then at every step, I have to be sort of satisfied or turned on or inspired or whatever you say. So sometimes it would be with the bass uh, and sometimes it would be with the guitar and just sit there and wait till something comes and then just keep building it. You know, really basic. I mean, caveman, Neanderthal, really. There's nothing, there's, I don't know. It's just the way to do it. I keep doing it until I like it. And then when I like it, I do the next bit. And then and then when I when a guy comes in to record me, it always sounds completely different than what I expect to just, you know, I'm like in the care, it's like, oh, none of that work, you know. So then I just go through that process with him and I've worked with him forever. So this is 2005. So it was no, it's really easy. Um, not the job, but the process in terms of, okay, just stay here until I get something good, you know. The poor fucker used to be in there when I just would start with a riff, you know, hours and hours of playing stuff. I'd be like, I feel bad for him. He sat there and like looking online and stuff like that. And I'd be like, trying to find inspiration um and now i do all that dirty work when no one's around and i love it i just sort of you know play the music in my studio which is just a bedroom in my house and like but it's tricked out so it looks like a studio but it's a bedroom and it's got an apollo with two outputs because i i don't play with anyone so therefore it's one person at a time it's all i need and the laptop but i have it on this um stephen um slate uh apollo interface where well, it looks like these two big screens and a desk looks like fucking like the TARDIS and it's not <laughs> it's just two screens <laughs> it's two screens but it feels really good they've got like panels on the ceiling that I painted red you know sound things so it looks tricked out it looks like Lenny Kravitz it looks like a Lenny Kravitz offshoot and um it's a vibe got a little balcony and I, so I'm in there so I used to sit with a cassette recorder, drum machine, and do things, then go into rehearsal and be like, okay, you play this, just keep playing this, blah, blah, blah. then I'll sing this bit, you know, like even more Neanderthal. Neanderthal man without a shave. And, uh, and that was wild. And then um, now I just do it like that. And, and everyone else has a studio, so I can send ideas along um, to, we have a producer, uh, and then I take my session to him, and then we'll then, he likes to do pre-production on that. And then everyone comes and plays on it and we're done. That's it. And sometimes they, you know, I might write on someone else's riff. You know, they might send me a riff, might send me music. I like doing that. And I'll sing on that. I can do top lines. When I just do top lines, it's like a doggle, like I shave three days off the process, you know? Okay, yeah. Great. 
Thank you for that. Yeah, good. And then I have to put it in and I cut it around how I want, you know, sections to be to suit the vocal top lines. And uh, that's it. So it's changed a lot, you know, but at the end of the day, it's still trying to find a common emotion um, and expressed in a singular way so that people can identify with it. That's, that's it. And I think that in the first one, you know, if you, if you, like when I first began, I saw no horizon. You know, I just thought, oh, I'm in a band. Now I've got a bit of success. I'm in a band forever. I'm never going to die. I'm always going to be on stage. I'm always going to be number one. And then um, you realize that uh, you're wrong. And that's not the case. And uh, everything's fleeting. <laughs> and you're fucked. Um, so, <laughs> well, you might as well really um, not waste any time or any recordings. And there's times in my life creatively where I think I've let things slide because I felt I was better than I was. <laughs> and I didn't confront myself about certain things creatively, finish that section, make it better. Is that lyric the best lyric to come up with? Is that the best arrangement? I think a few times I just sort of was like, nah, I feel good about that. And, and all that's happened now is that a bit more humility as you get older, and a bit more sort of, um, appreciation and gratitude and you go well if I want the most out of this I better make sure it's right so I, I feel more detailed and and more um hard, I make make it harder to please myself you know I mean? before I'd be like ah he's going to put a great line on that oh that's going to be wicked I can cover that in feedback or you know doesn't that you know and 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 the truth is everything matters and so I think that's why we've managed to do these new records last few records where we're really gaining momentum and literally becoming just a better band as we learn more. I mentioned I love the sound of this album, like specifically just the way all of these songs crash in. It sounds so great. What is a perfect sounding album for you sonically? Uh, White Pony, Deftones. Uh, Sex Pistols, never mind the bollocks, because it just holds up. Uh, Bone Machine, uh, Surf Rosa, the Pixies. Um, they, they, and the uh, Zeppelin. Yep. I mean, Zeppelin is it's remarkable. You know, they, they just hold up. The clarity is just is stunning. And uh, so those things, um, you know, it's funny because that, you know, conversely, you go back and check other things and you're like, damn, those hi hats are high. Or wow, that vocal was so loud. People did make big choices. You know, they made big choices and songs we know and love um, that when you I analyze them and you and use it yourself, you go, I'm not having my hi hats that loud. That's really <laughs> yeah. I don't like hardware. I like I like you have to have hardware to create excitement. But it, so many records have like louder hi hats than the fucking you know than the guitars or the voice or you know it's just like oh my god what were you thinking you know um, you know I always think you listen to like um, only on the subject I love the Kings of Leon but if you listen to that song. Uh, Whoa, I think that's Coldplay. Um, one of those major songs, <laughs> brilliant songs, and I'm saying because I love them, so I want to put it in the right context. I love them. And the whoa, oh, when they had that massive record, Use Somebody, that, that whole record, right? When you listen to those mixes, those, whoa, those woes are so quiet. You can't believe they're in the studio going, that's fucking great. They must be like, hey, turn the, turn the woes up, they're wicked. I mean, it didn't affect their success. But in terms of a record making level, when you isolate, listen to that mix, you'd be like, well, if you mix it today, I bet you'd turn those O's up. That's always weird because you say that, but I was like, how did they get away with it? And I loved that song. And so what's weird is it didn't really matter to me. It, it mattered more when I isolated, listened to it. Because what I'd be like, well, singing with it like a moron, because I loved it. But actually, when I listened to it, I was like, oh, I wonder if they would turn those. Because that's a great band. That's a really, what a singer. Fantastic singer. Now, you've had the pleasure of being around a lot of great rock stars and musicians over the years. I want to ask you, does one come to mind as the funniest? If I asked you, who's the funniest rock star or musician that you've met and dealt with and conversed with? Chris and my band is really funny. And uh, we humor is the cornerstone of everything in our world. You know, we, we have like, we have some really good times um, in the band. Um, but I think, oh my God, you know who? Who? Yeah. James Blunt. Really? James Blunt. The funniest fucker. I sat next to him. I was uh, David Furnish, Elton John's husband's 
birthday party and I sat next to him and uh, he told me some great stories. Um, he used to be uh, a, uh, in the Queen's Guard, right? He was a soldier going around in England. We have a, we have this thing called the Royal Family, right? And they have these like the pomp and ceremony of the Royal Family. It's big in England, right? And a uh, big tourist attraction. They're like, they're like, ben, they're like Ben and Jerry's in England, right? Royal <laughs> And um, <laughs> he, there was a coronation or some big event, right? And so these, the horsemen, he was a horseman for uh, uh, the Queen, Queen's Cavalry. They're in Hyde Park in London. Any, any of your tourist listeners will know it, right? And they, for six months, they train these horses to go round and round this track, right? So that when they go on the day with the Queen on the TV, with everyone in England watching and, you know, expats in Jamaica or wherever the fuck, um, uh, the horses behave, you know, like they're in a formation. And so he was doing this and he was in a formation like an, like a, like an arrow. And he said, um, he was going and his horse got spooked, you know, so it just jutted out in front of the queen, right on the big wall after six months of training. And he looked at her all scared and she looked around at him and she goes, Will you get back? <laughs> he's telling me all this thing. He's a funny guy. Anyway, anyway, so he's a, he's a funny. He's he's good lad. He says some funny things about his audience, which I can't repeat because it's not fair. But it was, yeah, he was very funny. He's a funny guy. That's uh, a good answer. He lives in Ibiza. Oh yeah, he knows a good time. This guy. He I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. So like, this. And you ever see his tweets like, you know, he, what was a couple of years ago, you know, if you thought this year was bad, I'm releasing a record next year. He does all <laughs> yeah. that. He's that guy. He's super self-deprecating, really funny. He's a great guy. I really, I had one evening with him and I, and I had so much fun with him. A memorable one. Yeah. So this show is called My Mom's Basement. And on the show, we talk about some nerdy things, some things that make us geek out from time to time. And I wanted to bring up, there's a great, bush song on the soundtrack of the avengers movie into the blue came out about 10 years ago right. at this point over 10 years ago now you also have a uh song in the soundtrack of the crow 2 city of angels another comic book character any memories of those two songs well just that you're, you're happy they found a home i love that song into the blue again i love i i really like that song and you don't know whether you put it behind you know when you put it into a film you know we had um you know, John Wick had bullet holes. So, you know, it's just, it's just like fun by association. I mean, you know, obviously with Brandon Lee, that was an extreme tragedy. And, and, and uh, so it's not a great memory of that because, you know, Brandon Lee lost his life. So that's pretty awful. So thanks for that. But uh, it no, was the no, second no. movie. He wasn't in that one. <laughs> it wasn't a oh, good, good, good. No, good. no, no, no. no. For that. I was like terrible. Yeah, it was the um, sequel. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring up old wounds like that. No, nah, no, nah, it's okay. It's okay. I had to. No, I could not mention it, right? That's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Great songs, though. I, mean, I think. Well, I think. Thank you. I think with those songs, you know, you just get. Um, I love having songs in movies. I want to have a song with Amy to be in a movie because it's so romantic. I mean, I'm just on it. I just happen to be there. She's the one that makes it fucking crazy. I'm just like it made me. I I got she. I asked her to sing with me, right? I said, hey, you want to sing this song? We're going to be in your hometown in a couple of weeks. And I, uh, she goes, well, I, um, I'm just flying back that day, so I don't know if you can do the song, but I want to come to the show. I thought that was a really polite, classy no. You know what I mean? I thought that was really sweet. So I sent her the song anyway, because I'm a salesman. And so I was like, fuck it, let's see if she likes it. And she sent it back with a vocal on it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, honestly, I... It, I, I it, Goosebumps, tears in my eyes. Just, just couldn't believe that I was associated with something so good because it was like she gave us real class. She's a powerhouse. Yeah, she's unbelievable. One of the best vocalists of her generation, I would say. Uh, 100%. So I saw your Zane Lowe interview recently where you talked about like kind of running to America away from Britpop when Oasis and everything was going huge. Did you ever actually have like run ins with that scene though at that time or were you guys yeah, completely 100%. separated? No. 100% because where I live in London, I mean, I live in America now with my kids, but I have, we keep a place there. And my house was 100 feet from the pub 
called the Queens, where everyone would go. There was, a, there was a recording studio in my little, it's a village actually, where I live, Primrose Hill Village, but it's like a little village. And there was a great recording studio there. And um, actually it wasn't great, but it was really fun studios. And so there was always Blur, Primal Screen, Oasis, Suede. It was stupid. I mean, it was real, that was a real scene. And uh, they'd go to that pub and everyone would be hanging out and everyone would end up at Noel's house up the road. I went to Noel's house a few times. I was like, I'm more of a sort of a, I have that lone wolf thing. So I kind of knew the scene, I knew everyone, but could have passed by and have a couple of evenings with them. But then I was always away on tour. So I wasn't like um, part of the scene, but I know it's like Nelly Hooper, the English DJ, you know, produced, you know, Bjork and Massive Attack and all of that. And so that whole London scene, that London crowd, I just was part of it, you know, it just wasn't the music. I liked, I liked, I liked it too guitar-y. I like sort of post-punk and I like punk music. And I don't mean SoCal punk, I mean real punk music, I mean traditional punk music. So it was like, I couldn't find the, um, I like My Bloody Valentine. I liked throwing muses. I like band on 4AD, the Pixies. So they were the cool bands, you know, um, to me. And, um, so that you know, I never like, I never got into the Kinks. That's, that's the basis of all Britpop was the Kinks. I think is that yeah, and and it's a certain sound, um, and some they do it really so so well. I mean, those those bands are amazing. I mean, you know, obviously no ridiculous songs. I mean, really incredible. Uh, one of some of the best melodies of all time in pop music. It's really really good and a lot better as Oasis. Yeah, like, yeah. Two of them, these sort of like entities. Uh, okay. You're preaching to the choir. You know, I'm I'm with you. I think I'm with the rest of the world where I'm like, you guys are both crushing it out there. You're both selling out, right? Why don't you just get together and then we could sell out arenas and stadiums again? And you know, I think I think I think I I read it um a few years ago, so it may have changed his tune a little bit because I saw the documentary. He yeah, he showed the first bit of humility that I didn't know yet, but. uh I did read that he would rather eat shit than tour with his brother again. It's like, what an image. You know what, though? I just saw he did an interview. He came out and he said, never say never. And I was like, oh, softening up on that one, maybe. Who knows? Well, they'll go for a, they'll get a tremendous, they'll, they, they could do a stadium tour. They've, they've played yeah. it so well. It's like what, what are you, two years away from a stadium tour, and then they just have the last laugh. It's the same thing Guns N' Roses did a couple of years ago, right? They got gang back together and it went crazy. This is a bit of a generic question. I'm sure you've been asked this before, but I am genuinely curious as to what your answer would be. What are the first songs that come to mind when I ask you what's a song that you wish you would have written? I mean, I just read the Bono biography. Oh, time. yeah. So, you know, something like uh, Where the Streets Have No Name or one with or without you. It struck me how important that band are to me. Um, I think that uh, I was honored to record Heroes with with uh, David Bowie's uh, piano player, Mike Garson, who did on the, I did it for a music care charity for him. I did a, um, an event for him. So, any Bowie song I would take, you know, I'm afraid of Americans. I did for a Bowie tribute uh, after he passed away. He had this whole thing where they had it all Bowie alumni, all the people who played on his records and, and they had guest vocalists come in and sing. Literally the most nerve wracking gig I've ever done by a thousand miles. I mean, Amy ruined my day. Me going to see <laughs> Amy, like, because I have a little solo in that song. So I was like, don't fuck up the solo. I'd been fine on solo all tour, then I'd fucked up a couple of times. And it's just me and tracks. And so when I fuck up the solo, it's just like, oh, well, it is live. Bless yeah. him. <laughs> so, you know, twice, I just had two epic. Well, one, I came in off the one, so I just sounded jazzy. And one, I just flumped the first phrase. It was like, blah, 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 blah. and then I got my shit together. So it's just like... <laughs> So the, it makes me nervous performing with other people, having a responsibility and having a responsibility to Bowie and to his band and just, yeah. just 
I, I, it was two nights at the Wilton and I was so traumatized by the first night, like traumatized, I couldn't speak, traumatized, that I did my song, went great, and then I just got in the car and went home. And then I suddenly was at home at 9 20 going, but what about everyone else that's performing? Why did you leave? It's <laughs> complete uh, anxious uh, social uh, anxiety breakdown. And then so the next night we played and I watched everyone. I hung out. I relaxed. I had a couple of drinks. I was like, for fuck's sake, this is not, you know, enjoy your life. So the next night I, I did it. I did a 180 and had a really good time. But the first night I left my own devices. I, I was very anxious. So anything by Bowie. I actually got to see that Mike Garson, he took a tribute on tour where in every city he would go to, he'd bring up new people and stuff. And I went to the one in New York City, brought up Corey Glover from Live in Color to do a couple things, brought up yeah. Sting's son to do a couple things. It was a really tremendous concert and tour and everything yeah. like that. Mike Garson knows how to put on a, a good tribute, you know? Yeah, he's meaning we're talking about. He's doing these um, solo shows, well, duo shows, I guess. Uh, uh, piano, Bowie, piano songs yeah he's had luke from the struts doing it he's done a couple of those so it's for 100 people and so he's asked me to do one next year or is it uh, would be this year jesus christ he asked me last year <laughs> so i gotta I, I need to figure out when to do that i absolutely adore mike and i've done he's played on a song with bush and i did a song for him for music cares both on the um the kingdom deluxe versions and like for me my voice next to Mike Garson's playing is it's like a mic drop. It's a mic it's drop. Perfect. Yeah. Great but combination. Like, it's a bit like, bit like we're the same feeling with um, being with, um, with Amy. It's that sort of thing where you, you know, if you align yourself with people that are way better than you, some of your parts goes drastically upwards. You raise your, you raise your value. Like, what's up? I got Mike. What's up? I got Amy. You know, I'm so sorry. I'm in a hot air balloon. I'm miles above you now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. My final question. I'm going to wrap it back around to Oasis. Noel Gallagher once said that he summed up everything that he's ever wanted to say as a person with cigarettes and alcohol, rock and roll star, and live forever. He says after that point, he's just repeating himself, rephrasing it. If you had to pick three songs that you've written that sum up everything you've wanted to say, which three would you select? I don't want to come back down from this cloud because I think it shows a desire to live a full, exciting life and always aim for the best. Um, uh, heavy is the ocean. I mean, I've got so many words I can say, but these are the first things that come to my mind. Yeah. Because I shared a shared weight, a weight, a, a, a pressure that is shared is um, inevitably lesson, you know, and support is support is everything, you know. Um, so heavy is the ocean, and then um, I got a line from a record, a song that I wrote uh, was called "Bulletproof Skin." I wrote it for uh, Institute, but I'm also going to redo some Institute songs for Bush because I realized I should. Yeah, and I have. I'm really going to do that for the next record because I did that record and lots of people who know music love it and most people never heard it so I was like you see um, I see people like um, Neil Young and Dylan would have a song that would appear on three or four records and I was like what the fuck why, why am I like slaving over a hot studio why don't I incorporate some of this so in Bulletproof Spring I have this line to lose you is to never love again and I, I just always really proud of that lyric, you know. Um, so there you go. They're not necessarily my like, one's a big song and one album track and one other track, but it's just those words that first thing I thought of. I'll get off the phone and be like, "What's his number? I got some fucking other ones." <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Those are three great answers. And this has been a really great time to get down to sit down with you and pick your brain on this stuff. Uh, like I said, I really love the new album. So make sure everyone goes, checks it out. Bushofficial.com. You can get all the dates and everything like that. Merch, everything that you need to know about the band. Gavin, thank you very much for joining the show today. Thanks for your time. I enjoyed this a lot. I do a lot of these. I enjoyed this. Thank you. Appreciate it.